Today we are continuing a message series in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, so if you have a Bible with you, feel free to grab it and uh, turn to that. So uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, I'll mention there's one in the seat in front of you. Feel free to grab that and use it. In fact, you can even keep it and take it home if you want to. Uh, if you're using the Pew Bible like I am, then today we are going to be on page 1,145, so you can thumb your way there. Uh, just as a reminder, this, this sermon series is called Glue, and we call it Glue because we're talking about within the church how there are different things that we let into our lives that God can use to bind us together, but often the inverse of that thing, if we let it in our lives, it tears us apart. And it's especially applicable for the church, but it also implies in most cases to your home life, to your family, to your workplace, to your friendships. Uh, and so there's a lot we can pick up from this. The first uh, several weeks we've gone through, we're now in our sixth week of this, and, and over the first few weeks we talked about how pride was the first thing. Pride is something that if we let it in our lives, it tears our relationships apart. We think we're doing nothing wrong, but we frequently are, and we're not, we don't even have eyes open to it. We talked about how we can choose to live by the Spirit uh, of God, or we can live to choose by the Spirit of this world, or we can choose to live by the ways of this world, or the ways of God. Uh, or even in chapter 4, we talked about how we can talk about doing the right thing, or we could actually just go ahead and do it and let our actions speak for themselves. And last week, uh, Paul sort of shifted from that introduction, addressing these sins that are going on in the city of Corinth, which was a very wealthy city uh, in, the, in the ancient Roman world. It's on the Greek peninsula. It was at this point in time the capital city of the Greek state. Uh, and, and Paul is talking to them about all of these sins that have broken loose. And one of them that he addressed last week was that there was actually a member of that church who was showing up on a weekly basis and yet was in a sexual relationship with his stepmother, and was completely unrepentant about it. And Paul talked about, uh, in last week's lesson, which, which rolls right into this week's, about how, as a church, we have a responsibility. If there are grievous sins that are going on uh, from members in the church or leaders in the church, uh, and they're completely unrepentant about it, it's not just a matter of they had this sin happen, but they had it happen and say, hey, this is just the way I'm made, deal with it, then we have to actually address that. We can't leave it there, because that will destroy us as well. It'll tear us apart. And instead, we need to, in love, with compassion, uh, with a spirit of gentleness, come and have the conversations that need to be had. And that moves into our message for today. And as you're finishing turning there, I wanted to just briefly share a story from our house. I've got a photo to go here with it. Um, this is uh, sort of an average glimpse of our backyard. And uh, our, the, our dog, Petra, one of our two dogs, she's uh, an English Mastiff there in the lower right-hand corner. Um, she's the subject matter. But I do want to point out just for fun that you can see Annabelle does a great job of keeping our kids busy, and they have to work for commissions at home. They, they earn a little money that way. And so uh, you can see Marlo and Viola over there trying to rake dog poop into a container so they can clear it out of the yard, and they can get a quarter if they do that, so they're excited about that. And uh, Hazel and Hudson are over there picking up debris from the yard and cleaning it up and, and getting rid of it. But Petra is the main story. And, and we have two dogs. We have a 100-pound Rottweiler named Rocky, and he's four years old. He's a full-grown, and he's a big boy. And Petra there, she's only a handful of months old, so six months or so old. And her, her mom was 150 pounds, and her dad was 230 pounds. So our assumption is that Petra is going to be a pretty big dog before she's done. We know she's over 70 pounds now, and she's, she's rapidly working her way up the scales. We haven't weighed her in the last week or two. But she eats like nothing you've ever seen, if you watch that dog. Um, and our dog, Rocky, he eats three cups of food a day. Petra will eat 12 some days. And still, she's skinny. I didn't know she could put away food like that. Um, and with that, we, we give her three meals a day. And this morning, I took her out, and I, and I, I got up and went and got her her food. I put three cups in, a, in her big bowl and, and called her over and had her sit and, and had her go eat it. And the two dogs, the way they eat is very different. When Rocky eats, he seems like he's worried some thief is going to come and steal it before he gets done. And so his mouth does not leave the bowl. He just chomps and swallows as quick as he can. And 30 seconds later, the bowl is empty. There's nothing left. But Petra... She is a much more casual diner. She'll go up to the bowl, and she'll take a bite and start chewing on it, and kibble will be dropping from her face, and she'll kind of walk around and look around for a minute. Sometimes she'll meander out to the lawn and find some interesting smell, and I'll have to call her back and say, get your food done, dog, come on, and, and she'll eventually make it back there. The one nice thing about it, though, is she drips kibble everywhere while she's eating, is that normally one of the ways she's meandering is she'll go around and clean up her mess, and she'll pick it up as she goes. So this morning, she was doing that, walking around on the back deck, and the back deck's actually off on the right-hand side of the photo there. You can see the edge of it. 
And uh, I'm sitting in a lawn chair there watching her, hoping she'll get done with it. And she, she goes and picks up a little kibble here and picks up a little kibble there and picks up a little kibble here. And as she's making her circuit, I look and I think, what is that on the ground over there at the edge? And it turns out, from the look of it, it's a great big pile of crow poop or something like that. It was not a small bird that made this deposit. And Petra does her rounds, and you might guess where this is going. And she walks along, and she finds that poop, and she gives it a sniff for a second, longer than with the kibble. And then she goes, what the heck? And, and just starts chewing it up. And while she's doing it, she pauses for a second like, oh, that isn't good. Oh, well. And then she just goes back to chewing. And, like, there's even some white filth, like, at the edge of her mouth. I'm like, oh, this is disgusting. That dog, she, uh, she desecrated herself, you know? Like, I just watched and I cringed and I thought, what is going on here? And I couldn't help but think, you know, they say dogs have 300 times the sense of smell that human beings do. I can tell it's poop from five feet away. There's no way that dog did not know what she was putting in her mouth. But she was committed to it. And she decided, this will be a nice treat. we got dessert right here. Then I'll go back to the bowl. Now, I point that out. I point that out to say that, you might guess where this is going, sometimes we have something in common with Petra. Sometimes we put things in our, in our, in our mouths, in our minds, in our bodies. We let things into our life that are actually quite gross, and they're quite destructive. And the interesting part is, as we're doing it, we don't typically see it. We think we're just fine, and that it's normal, just like Petra did. But often it's the people around us who look, and they're like, Ooh, <laughs> what are you doing? That's not a smart idea. Uh, and yet, as Paul's going to talk to us about today, when that happens, we have an obligation as Christians to try to address it, to try to spit that back out and get our lives on the right track. And that's really a big part of what Paul is going to address in Corinth. This sermon is going to have sort of two applications. The first one uh, is going to be there, and, and then it's going to play into the second. Um, but we're going to really focus on the second part of this passage for our primary application today, though there's valuable information to be gotten from both. So, Again, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. As usual, we're going to break our passage down into four different parts. We'll read it, we'll stop, we'll discuss it, and I hope that God will use that to bring it to life for you. Before we begin, let's take just a moment and come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I don't know what everybody ate this morning, uh, but I hope it was better than Petra. I pray that you would help us to see ourselves and the sin in our life soberly today. Help us to make a real assessment not of our neighbor, but, but of us. Lord, we know we can't change them, but we can change us. Help us to surrender our lives, to hear your word, to be con convicted and transformed by it. Lord, we trust our lives to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so there's a lot here, and I'll warn you today, it's a little bit longer passage, so it's going to be really rich on the word of the Lord and leaner on the word of the Lloyd. Hopefully you guys will be able to live with that. But uh, we'll begin with verses 1 through 6. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? If you were to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about, much, uh, about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. Now, this is a principle that's largely unpracticed in the modern church, but it's an important one here. Um, I want to talk about the brief principle, and we're going to dig into little bits of this passage that probably raised your eyebrows a little bit. So Paul is talking to this church in Corinth, and he's pointing out that there are several different financial disputes going in the church. And to be clear up front, Paul is not talking about serious you know, uh, felony-like criminal matters. So if somebody came in and, and killed a family member, Paul's not saying, go to the church leadership and ask them to straighten it out. We don't have the authority to do that. Uh, we don't have the power to do that. We don't have the facilities to store somebody with that kind of behavior in. Um, so with that kind of serious offense, you need to go before our civil authorities. But what he is saying is that in smaller civil matters that go on, so for example, uh, if, if I was renting a house 
uh, from, from Serenity over here, and I didn't pay her on one month, and I skipped it, and she said I owed money, and I said I didn't. We could go try to sue each other in court over that, or Paul's pointing out it actually would be better if you went to the church, if you went and talked to their leadership, and you actually asked them to step in and try to help you resolve it. And that could be done a few ways. You could actually come to the church's leadership itself and, and request that they do it. If you ask the eldership to be a part of it, you could go and you could find a fellow trusted person. Maybe both of us agree uh, that, we, that we really like Alan over here and we trust him. And so Alan will be the mediator for us and we agree whatever he says goes. But either way, the idea is we try to resolve that outside of the courtroom because when we're in a fight with each other in the courtroom, does it look like Christianity is something you want to be a part of? No. And that is emphasized all that much more for a few reasons. First of all, when Paul's writing this, he's writing this to this ancient Roman culture. And Christianity, you know, now it's the largest religion on planet Earth. It was nothing even close to that then. It was a very, very small subset of Judaism. And in most cities, it was only a handful of people who were actually Christian. Now, what's fascinating is that from the time of Jesus' death to a couple hundred years later, that's going to really change. It's going to go from being an obscure religion that most people had never heard of to being the official religion of the Roman Empire and being spread across the entire Western world. In fact, there's going to be missionaries hitting places like India and China within 150 years of Christ's death. That's pretty significant. So the gospel is going to spread and grow. But right now, at this point in time, 99% of the culture is not Christian better than 99%. And so for these people in Corinth, they're this small subset. Now added to that as well is in the ancient world, when you would be brought on trial in an area like this, typically it'd be in an outdoor area. There'd be an actual seat, normally a stone seat, that was the judgment seat in that community. And you would go sit on it. And then whatever judge or Roman official who was responsible for making those decisions, you'd sit before him. You'd make your case. The other person would make their case. Everybody and their dog from the community could stand around and watch. In fact, people often did gather around just to kind of see what the latest gossip is and what happened in those situations. And that judge, whenever he decided, I've heard enough from you, he'd make a decision. And whatever decision he threw out, that was it. So really, it's a very public thing. There's no, there's no jury of your peers. And I'll point out, it's an interesting contrast because in America, 100 years ago, 90% of our population, if you asked them, would say that they were Christian. Um, that percentage has been declining year over year. And especially if you look at the last 30 or so years, we're dropping about a percentage a year, if you look at the averages, in terms of the number of people who even profess to be a Christian. Here, about 15 years ago, it was somewhere around 70%. And now we're getting down, they're saying, that we, have, we don't have the most accurate data, but in census data, we're getting down closer to 60%. So that means here in another decade, potentially, Christians could become a minority in the United States. In terms of, and that's not devout Christians, that's just people who, if they were asked to check a box, are you atheist, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, they check the Christian box. That doesn't actually substantiate it anyway. So it's fascinating to me in a sense because 100 years ago in this country, if you'd gone to court and you were heard by a jury of your peers, you probably would have been heard nine out of 10 times by Christians. It would have been actual other believers who were involved in settling it. Today, there's not that guarantee. And in fact, more and more, our culture, it's not identifying as Christian. And we're coming to a point where we may be a minority and, and we may be outsiders where we're looked at as, okay, you guys, are, you guys are that weird little group of Christians we've heard of you before. Apparently that was a big thing years ago, but not now. That makes it all that much more important as believers that if we can, we resolve our issues amongst each other and not take them outside of us. Now, I realize that's not a common practice nowadays, but there's actually some sense in it. Do whatever you can one-on-one -on -one, to resolve it with whoever you have the dispute with. If you can't do that, try to take it to the church leadership. Again, we're not talking about serious criminal things, but with civil things like that. And Paul's going to build on this a little more in a moment. Before we go to that, let's talk about some of the more uh, strange aspects of that passage. Verse 2 says, Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? Now, the idea here isn't that you and I right now are going to stand around and judge the world and say, oh, guilty, innocent, guilty, innocent, and go down the line. The idea is, and this is fascinating, Paul is actually saying that when God judges the world after the second coming of Christ, and we're all brought together and we all have to answer for what we're saying, he seems to be saying we're going to have some opportunity for testimony in it. So maybe it'll, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but an idea might be, you know, maybe somebody who is lukewarm as a believer is there. And, and God gives an opportunity. All right, Lloyd, what was your experience with him? Well, you know, I was hungry at one point, and I was starving, and he fed me, so there's that. You know, and there could be this opportunity to share. So Paul's saying, if you get to have a say someday, 
in the, in the whole conversation of whether somebody goes to hell or not, can't you solve a $200 dispute without going to court? Couldn't we resolve that as well? Um, the next part, later on in verse 2, as it continues, it says, And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Verse 3, Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Now, this is something we see in a couple places in Scripture, but Paul's suggesting this idea that, again, at the final judgment, one of the things that we have some role in, and we don't know exactly what that looks like, is when the angels themselves are going to be judged, and we'll have some say in what happens with them as well. That's fascinating because, I don't know about you guys, but I haven't seen a whole lot of angels in my life, so I feel kind of unqualified. I think that when we get to the other side, we're going to see that that supernatural element, uh, as the Bible indicates, was a big part of our life, whether we saw it or not, that God... Uh, was in our lives intervening at times, trying to get us from walking into that sin or keep us from a real danger out of his love and compassion for that. We see that in the Old Testament in several different stories. And here in our lives now, we see that happen. I think part of why we don't see, for example, the New Testament emphasize that is that historically there was an issue with people trying to worship angels and pretend they were God instead of God. Uh, And so we're avoiding that confusion. But there's that element as well. So now starting in verse 7, Paul's going to build on this, and he's going to give us more application. If we have these civil disputes, we should solve them amongst ourselves. We shouldn't go the other way. And now we're going to get into the why. And I'm going to warn you guys in advance, I hope you wore your steel toe boots, because I'm going to be stepping on some of you as we do this. 7 through 11. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been, have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brother and sister. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. All right, going back to verse 7, it says, The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. What he's talking about is the church. And really, what this comes down to is, if you know that if I have a knockdown, drag out argument with another believer, especially in a big public forum, saying, you know, Kent owed me $700, and he says, no, I didn't, I promise, I already paid you that, and we go back and forth, and we're having a fight out in the middle of town with everybody watching about this, is that the church you want to go to? No. You want to go get advice from either of those people on, you know, how to handle your finances or how to do life right? No. You ruin the testimony. And you know, it might be right. You know, Kent might be right, and I might be completely wrong. That misses the point. What Paul is saying is that these small amounts of money, you know, relatively small compared to the eternity that we're talking about, that we get into fights over, when we do that, we disqualify the church. And if we become a church that's filled with that kind of thing, we're, we're all constantly looking for an excuse to sue the other person, would anybody want to be here? No, they'd probably walk across the street to avoid us just to not be on the same side as we were on, worried we'd come and sue them next. So in the church, this is happening, and it's tearing them apart. And Paul's saying, you guys have already lost the fight. Your church is dead if you can't get past this. If you're going to be the kind of people who your kingdom and the pettiness of, I want that $1,000, and I'm not going to let him take advantage of me, if that is the most important thing to you, then you're not living for the kingdom. Your priorities aren't there. You should be focused on God's kingdom and what that looks like. And again, Paul's not saying there aren't mechanisms by which you could try to solve it. In fact, he's giving mechanisms by which you can solve it. Go talk to the person in person. Go take it to the church leadership. Find somebody you both agree on. Try to have it mediated. But do whatever you can to avoid this thing becoming a civil matter because when it does, it can be embarrassing for you and embarrassing for the church. And he points out this this has already had an impact on you guys. And he asked that question, continuing on in verse 7, he says, Why would you rather not be wronged? Why wouldn't it be better that you be wronged and let the name of Jesus not be defamed from this fight, even if you're in the right? Why would you rather not be cheated? Same question, you know. Yes, maybe you are being taken advantage of, but try these Christian solutions to find a way out of it, you know, and and see if you can do it that way. If not, maybe it's better. I I would hate to lose $1,000. That would be a big deal to our family. But 
it would be better than Jesus' name being defamed if that's the end result. If everybody sees there's just this petty fight going on uh, and they, they perceive our church and Christianity and Jesus himself to be represented by that, that's a challenge. He says in verse 8, Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. And this is even worse yet, because the fact that this is happening, probably somebody's right and somebody's wrong, but that means one person is wrong, and they might even be regularly doing this in the church. And by the way, if there was a habit of that, if somebody had a habit of always borrowing money and never paying it back, and everybody's talking to the church leadership saying, this guy stole from me again, that's going to come to a point where we're going to ask you to not be a part of the church anymore if you're not willing to address it. Those kind of things have to be dealt with, just like the last chapter uh, pointed out. But Still, we, we can try to resolve that in-house. Again, I realize that's countercultural, uh, but it's what Paul's saying, so it should mean something to us. Verse 9, it turns, and it turns on some, some uh, painful ways. And I'll say, as we read this, we're really good as a people that look at this and say, like, yeah, I know a guy who's exactly like that. We don't do as good at saying, yeah, that guy is me. And that's what we need to be looking for. You can't control your neighbor who has problems with alcohol, but you can decide today whether you're going to drink a lot of it or not. You have that ability. Um, so let's focus in on that as we walk through this. Verse 9, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? So he's saying some people are going to be disqualified from salvation. Now, as we go into this, let me clarify what he's talking about. He's talking about not people who have done this thing once, but people whose lives are owned by these sins. But to, to understand it, we better define the sins. So he says, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral so those are people who are engaged in any sort of sexual immorality. That's everything from, from uh, sex out of wedlock to prostitution uh, to having an affair to looking at pornography would even be included in that. And I know, yes, they didn't, have, uh, they didn't have pornography in the conventional sense back then, but they did actually have drawings that were intended for that very purpose. So the idea is there. So neither the sexual immoral nor idolaters. Now, idolaters in the common sense, in the ancient world, you think of people who actually are bowing down and worshiping other gods. They're going to these other shrines. That's the, the common sense. But really, idolatry is anytime you choose to put something in your life above God, anytime you make that decision. And so let me, let me just put it this way. If you're choosing to not go to church because you really wanted to stay home and watch the football game, ouch. Um, is it because God's most important or football's most important? Where does God lie on that? Or maybe you're going because you want to go to a sporting event or you want to go to a kid's sporting event. Or maybe you're going because you just feel like you want to sleep in that day. And it's not just about going to church. It's about everything in your life, every area of obedience. Are you raising your kids the way God says? Are you being the friend that God wants you to be? Are you being the parent that he wants you to be, the daughter that he wants you to be, the son that he wants you to be, the, the employee he wants you to be? We choose so many other things over God, and we pursue them first. We need to have God first in our life. And when other people look at us, they need to be say, well, it's pretty obvious that God's always come first there. That's a high standard, but we need to aspire for it. Otherwise, we're, we're idolaters. Next is adulterers, people who break the marriage covenant and uh, have sex with people outside of it. Um, nor those who have, uh, neither, nor men who have sex with men. So we're talking about homosexuality here. And yes, that's directly forbidden. Um, I, I want to point out, we're, we're getting caught up in this, but there's a lot of things in this same sentence that you may not struggle with homosexuality, but there's some things in this sentence that are going to be listed right next to it that probably will stomp on your feet a little bit. It says, nor thieves, so people who take things that aren't theirs. And I think we tend to think, well, if I'm not robbing banks, I'm not stealing stuff, but when you go to the, when you go to the grocery store and steal a candy bar, you're every bit a thief in the same way. You don't think so. Or when you take something from your employer, you know, he won't notice that I took a few boxes of this product. It's not that big a deal, you know. And, and besides, he owed me more anyway, and he didn't give it to me, so I'm justified. We come up with all kinds of excuses, but you're stealing stuff. You're being a thief. And if that's a part of who you are, that is a problem. Nor the greedy, people who are prioritizing wealth over God. How many hours a day do you spend in your Bible versus spending on Amazon? Ouch. That one hits me. <laughs> Maybe it's just say I, I normally use Walmart.com, Pastor, so I'm okay. That's not, that's not exactly the way it works, though. Uh, you are focused on stuff instead of the Lord. And look, at, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for you to buy stuff, and I'm not saying you can't go read some reviews. But the point here is when stuff becomes more important than God, we have a problem. If, if there's something in your life you're not able to give up for the sake of the kingdom, then it owns you. You don't own it. There's a big principle there. Greed is winning out. Nor drunkards. 
This is another one of those. With all these sins, we like to grade on a curve, and I think drunkards is one of the most caricatured of those. I have worked with a lot of people who have struggled with alcoholism, and like so many things, we tend to think, you know, I come home and I only have, you know, three or four beers every night. I'm not really a drunk. It's not a big deal. You look, my friend over there, he drinks a 12-pack every night. He's a drunk. He's different. And we're missing it, you know. If we have to excuse it, there's a problem there. And I'll say, with drunkenness, we can include other chemical substances we get to addicted to as a culture. If your doctor's prescribing you something because you have chronic pain or something like that, that's a different thing. That's between you and your medical provider. But really, we're talking about using chemical substances to alter our state of mind. We want to get out of this state of mind into a different one, and we're going to use something like that to get here. And I'll point out, fascinatingly, that in the ancient world, hard liquor didn't exist. That wasn't a thing. Wine is the most common form of alcohol by far that exists. And wine in the ancient world, because the processes of refining and creating it were much, uh, were much less refined, you actually had a much lower alcohol content than you have today. Even then, Greek scholars of this time period, you can, you can read saying things like, if a person dilutes their wine less than 50%, they're a drunk. Whoa. But in the ancient world, typically wine was used for the, uh, the disinfecting of water. So many people did use it to get drunk, but Paul's saying here, that's not acceptable. Don't even get into it. And if you feel like you're not sure or you're somewhere sliding on that scale, I'd encourage you, just be careful with it because we are really good as a people in all of our sins at justifying ourselves and saying, you know, it counts for them, but not for me. I'm okay. So just, just have caution with it. It doesn't take much to get there. And I've, I've never known somebody who picked up alcohol for the first time and said, my goal is to ruin my life and be a drunk. But I've met a lot of people who got there without intending to. Uh, it's an easy path to come down. And it's not just with that, but with many other mind-altering substances. Here Paul's saying, don't get sucked up into it. Don't get owned by it. Uh, it's ter- that's, that would be a terrible thing. Nor slanderers. This one hits home. So slanderer is somebody who speaks ill of somebody else and doesn't have the, the tact or integrity to do it to their face. This is somebody who's going around and, and talking trash about somebody else behind their back, and they're stirring up trouble that way. And it's really easy to get caught up in this. In effect, this is gossip, okay? And a sign that you know you're getting caught up in gossip is when other people come and approach you, and, and then they say, hey, did you hear anything new about them? What's going on here? You know, tell me more of the story. I want to get in on it and hear the rich details. And look, the Bible says that if you have a problem with your brother or you're concerned for them, then go talk to him. Go actually have a conversation in love with compassion to say, hey, I'm... I'm concerned about you. I see this going on. Or, you know, when you made this comment the other day, you may not have realized it. I just wanted to say, man, it really hurt. Like, it sounded like you were indicting me. And, and so I wanted to talk to you about it and try to fix it. Those are good, healthy conversations to have. But in our culture, the popular thing to do is instead to go to five of that person's friends and tell them about it. You tell everybody and their dog except that person and make sure that they know about it. All right, so not slanderers, nor swindlers. A swindler, that's somebody who is cheating somebody else out of money. He's always looking for an angle to get somebody under wrongful terms to give them something that's different than actually just having a healthy business transaction. But you're actually trying to leverage something or trick somebody or con them. Uh, And apparently some of that's going on in the church because there's lawsuits happening regarding it among the people in Corinth. So that has, has cut loose in there. And he says, all the people who do those things will not inherit the kingdom. That's heavy. Now, again, we're talking about people whose lives are owned by that. People who are, who uh, you might not define yourself as it, but when other people look at you, if they say like, hey, did you see Bob today? Man, that guy was sober. I don't know when the last time was I saw him that way. That's probably a sign right there. If those kind of comments are happening or if people are on their guard because they're worried you're going to take advantage because you may not think you are, but they all get the sense you are. That's probably a bad sign. So, We've got to be really cautious because our perception of ourselves is off on this, and we need to make sure our heart's in the right place. And Paul's going to build on this as he goes. Um, verse 11, and that's what some of you were. Notice he uses past tense. He says, you guys were defined by this. That's what you were before, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So he lists several things there. You were washed. That's, that means your sins were washed away. Often that's a reference to baptism, uh, to that first step in your Christian faith. Uh, it says you were sanctified. To be sanctified means to be set apart for a holy purpose. Some of you may not realize this when you signed on to be a Christian, but the minute you made that decision, you actually said to God, God, from here on out I'm yours, 
and you do what you want with me. And that's God's intention. God has a plan for every one of you. It may not be the plan you thought, but God has a plan for every one of you to grow his kingdom and to be a part of it. And when you became a believer, God's desire was that you be taken from where you were, from the sin you were caught up in, and you'd be set aside for a holy use. You'd be set apart to serve him in a special way. And if our eyes are fixed on him, if our hearts are with him, God will reveal what those purposes are. He'll start to show us what that is and bring us into that obedience. But we're, we're set apart for a holy purpose. We're sanctified. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the other thing is, of course, that we're made on right terms with God. The justified, we sometimes say, just as if I had never had sinned, is the idea there. Jesus paid the price for us. He cleansed us. And now we can be in right standing with God. Paul's saying, you were in that position, but many of you now are muddling your way back out of it. You're making these choices, and, and it's destroying you. You need to be cautious about it. Let's continue with verses 12 through 17. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything. But I will not be mastered by anything, you say. You say, food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute. Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. A lot happens here, so let's just go back to the top. First, Paul is going to look at three different common excuses that are circulating around in the Corinthian culture. And we have some ones like it that we use nowadays. The first one he'll repeat twice, and there's really two senses in which we can understand it. So let's, let's look at that first. Verse 12, I have the right to do anything, you say. So that's the first excuse. And you hear that in our country all the time. There's many things that you can do that the Bible says are immoral in our society, and yet our legal system won't stop you from it. You have the right to do it. Our culture will allow you to. They won't frown on you for it. They might even encourage you in it. And so people in Corinth are saying, hey, look at I'm a free person, and I can do what I want to do. And if I want to go have sex with temple prostitutes, well, then by Jove, that's what I'm going to go do. There you go. Paul's response to that idea, to that sentiment, if it's my liberty to do this, well, he says, not everything you do is beneficial. Yeah, you can do a lot of crazy, dumb things with your life, but you're not going to gain from all of them. And so uh, Paul's pointing out, you need to be careful about that. Continuing on, he says, I have the right to do anything, quoting them. Now, another way that people talk about having the right to do anything, particularly in the church, and we can see this in Corinth through future verses, people will say, you know, when Jesus died, he died for all of my sin, past, present, and future. So my sin's covered. So what's the big deal if I want to go do something sinful? So what if I want to go do that? The price is already paid. And Paul responds to that sentiment. Okay, well, I will not be mastered by anything. And what Paul's pointing out here is we tend to think that we're the one controlling our sins, that we're the ones choosing them. But I have to tell you, at some point, when you hand yourself over to that, you become addicted to it. You become owned by it. And it is weird how it'll call to you. I think of my years struggling with pornography addiction. I, you'd think I'd just flip a switch and be done with it. Isn't it that simple? I had a lot of habits built up over a long time, and I had to actually get sick and tired of it and get motivated enough and surrender to God enough that I was willing to say, you know what, I'm not going to have a computer at my house. I'm not going to have cable TV at my house. I'm going to just burn all of these distractions. I'm not going to hang around with friends that glorify this kind of thing because it'll draw me back into it. And when you get sick and tired enough of it, then God will actually work in that and he'll set you free from it. But you, that will never happen as long as you're making excuses about your sin. And we're going to be told here in a minute by Paul that our bodies are a temple of God. But I have to tell you, sometimes when I watch other Christians walking around and how they're living, I think they think it's more of an amusement park. That's not the point. You're sanctified. You're set apart. You're supposed to be living in this other way, and that's God's desire for you. But you can just keep on doing it. You have the right to do it. Finally, the last excuse, and this one even dates back. We can read the same one in Ezekiel. It dates back hundreds, if not thousands of years in its use. So it's a long-term excuse. Verse 13, you say, food is for the stomach 
and the stomach is for food, and God will destroy them both. That's an interesting excuse. Now, what's behind this? The principle behind this is that people are saying, you know what? God gave me a stomach, and here's a great big plate full of food, and so obviously I can eat as much as I want whenever I want. I just go ahead and do whatever I want. Why would God give me a stomach if he didn't want me to fill it as full of food as I could every chance I got? Now, of course, we know that's not really the right way. God did give us a stomach, and he did expect us to ingest food. We wouldn't have lived long had we not done so. Um, but we're, we're challenged in the, in the Bible even and, and in, our, in our normal lives to eat healthy foods, to eat food in moderation, to not get carried away. This idea that simply because I have a stomach, well, then I just eat as much as I want is a poor justification. And that principle is taken by the people in Corinth, and they can use it for other organs of the body, if you get my meaning. Well, God gave me genitals, so I guess I can go. I, he just wants me to use them. Why would he give them to me if he didn't want me to just go have sexual encounters with whoever I find and, and enjoy myself that way? But that's not God's intention at all. So Paul is going to push back on that little proverb of the day that's getting circulated in the church. He says, the body, however, second part of verse 13, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God didn't intend you to use your bodies for that. Let me be clear here. We read verses like this sometimes, and we think, oh man, God doesn't like sex at all. That's not what the Bible's saying, okay? God made sex. He instituted it. He doesn't have a problem with it. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing, but it's supposed to exist in the confines of marriage. That's, that's where it's supposed to happen. But everybody here is taking something that can be innately good, like eating food, and they're using it in a perverse way. And Paul's pointing out, that just doesn't work. You think you're doing this, but you're a slave to it. You're owned by it. And your body's not supposed to be owned by sin. It's supposed to be owned by God. That's God's plan, is that he be the one who is actually running your life and leading you and guiding you and building you up. Uh, verse 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Not just raising us on the day of final judgment when we're raised up uh, into heaven, but also right now, here now, raising us in the sense of God wants to set you free from your sins. He doesn't want you to continue living in them. Jesus Christ dealt with the issue of sin in two ways. He died, and in doing so, paid the price for our sin right then, but also part of our sanctification, part of our being set aside for holy use, is that he's going to come then and actually transform our character. And so if your moral fiber is exactly the same as it was the first day you became a Christian, you know, 20 years ago, now, something's wrong. You should have been transformed. There should have been some things changing. Those sins that had a foothold in your life, they should have started to disappear. And they, if they haven't, then you haven't really surrendered to God. You haven't fully given over. You've said he's your Lord, but you're not living like it. Do you not know, verse 15, that your bodies are members of Christ himself? So here he's saying we are actually connected intrinsically with Christ. We're part of his church. His spirit dwells in us. We're unified with him. So we, we have this connection with him. Shall I then take the member the members of Christ, and unite them with a prostitute. This idea of prostitution is fascinating in the ancient world. I would suggest to you that in our modern world, it's been replaced by pornography. We still have temple prostitutes. They're just in digital form. I suppose it's slightly more sanitary, uh, but morally it's not actually a high ground. Um, so in the ancient world, and we've, we've chatted about this in previous sermons, just in the city of Corinth, there were single temples to pagan gods that had over a thousand resident prostitutes at them. And your act of worship as a good believer is you would go in and you would pay your money and your, you'd do your Sunday service by sleeping with one of these prostitutes. It varied. You might do male or female. It was whatever, whatever the priest told you that day, and that would be your act of worship. Now, 99% of the society that these Christians are surrounded by are doing this. They don't raise an eyebrow at it. In fact, they'd expect you to. That's the context they're raised in. It's such a countercultural thing that Christianity is, and that, that people would just think, like, oh, of course, you, of course, you went and slept in with the prostitutes. And people in the church are still doing this. And nobody in the community is saying, oh, that's gross. Why would he do that? They're saying, of course he would. That's what we all do. But that doesn't make it right. And so Paul here is pointing out you were set aside. You were supposed to be a separate thing. You are unified with Christ. But when your body is committed to Christ, how can it then also be committed to a prostitute? And so, verse 16, he builds on this and tries to explain what's actually, where the problem is here. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it's said, the two become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. 
What Paul's saying here, he's pointing back to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, we see God had created man, uh, and he had brought man down to earth, and man had named all the animals and had this chance to connect with them and, and to become friends with them. And there was not this predatory behavior that animals have nowadays, but there was just this, this natural friendship that was between them. And Adam still, though, despite that, there's something missing in his life. And God sees that, and so he, he causes Adam to pass out. He takes a chunk out of his chest, and he uses that, combines it with the dust, and makes woman out of it. And that first marriage, in effect, happens at that point. Adam sees Eve and is utterly head over heels in love with her and you know, says, we're going to call her woman because she came out of me. And in effect, she's mine. I am in love with that girl. That's what I want. The first marriage happens there. And at the end of that passage, it says that the two become one flesh. And interestingly, we hear that, okay, you, you become, in effect, one body. But actually, in the Hebrew, there's an even deeper meaning there. It says, in effect, that there's a mingling of souls that happen when two people unite that way. And this is fascinating because this is God's plan for marriage. Two people coming together, committing to be together for life. And yet, if you look at what our culture says about sex, they don't say the same thing. They say it's, it's just a recreational activity. You should have it whenever you want with whoever you want. It doesn't have any consequence. It's just fun. Just use it that way. God has something different to say about it. He says it's actually sacred and set apart uh, and that it's something you know, that's only supposed to be used in a certain context. And here he's pointing out if your bodies are supposed to belong to Christ and you're supposed to be unified with him and his spirit's supposed to be living in you, when you go and fall into grievous sin like this and you go and sleep, for example, with a prostitute, it's like you're trying to merge Jesus and that whole act together and that math just doesn't work out well. When we fall into any of these sins deeply, we divide ourselves from Jesus. We create a barrier between us and him. And I'm not saying that barrier can't be removed, but if you hear God speak less after you do a sin like that, there's a reason. You have, you have distanced yourself, and you need to close the gap. You need to get intense enough to where you're ready to sacrifice what you need to have to sacrifice in order to stay focused on Jesus and make that a priority. Get rid of those things that are causing you to stumble God wants to dwell in you. His spirit wants to be connected to you. But if you're trying to connect your spirit, spirit in sinful ways with all kinds of other people, those two people don't dwell in that residence at once. That's not the way it works. You're, you're, you're taking one at the expense of the other. That doesn't mean you're not, irre, you're, you're not redeemable. Certainly you are. But we just need to realize the math. We're not helping our relationship with God and our standing with him when we do these things. In fact, we're destroying ourselves. Verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul wants us to avoid all these sins. Slander, homosexuality, theft, and on down the list. You can read them all again. He wants us to avoid all of these, but he's saying sexual sin is especially powerful in our life, and the, the, the human sex drive is certainly a powerful thing. We wouldn't exist as a species if we didn't engage in it, um, so that impulse needed to be strong. But, but we've got to be careful because there's a proper context for it, and when we get outside of it, it tends to desecrate us. It tends to, to foul us up. Whether we intend it to happen or not, that's what occurs and in doing so, we actually separate ourselves from God in a big sense. He says that our bodies are meant to be temples of the Holy Spirit. That's a fascinating idea, and it's a New Testament idea. In the Old Testament, God's Spirit, it dwelled in the temple, deep in the inner part of it. And only one guy could go in there one time a year. Nobody else was even allowed in there. If you wanted to go see God, you went to the temple, and you got somewhere in proximity to that. We see on rare occasions with people like prophets and judges where for a short time, God's Spirit will come on them, and then it'll leave them. But in the New Testament, we're told, and through Christian experience, we can find that if we commit our lives to Jesus and we're baptized into a relationship with him, his Holy Spirit will actually come dwell in us and make its home there, that he'll start to speak to us, that he'll start to give us that still small voice that guides us when we're making decisions in our life. And if we focus on him and we focus on his word, he'll work in a powerful way. And Paul's saying here, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. Jesus gave everything so that you could be set free for sin. So don't take your body and throw it into every sinful thing you can, but instead take it and commit it to Christ so that you can be made pure and you can be made clean through him. You were caught in these, these things, but you shouldn't be now. Your life should be transformed. 
and yet is it. I uh, wanted to share a story with you as we close that hopefully will drive this home. I, uh, years ago, I had, uh, well, first I got this car in high school that was a 1988 Chevy Beretta with 190,000 miles on it. That was the worst car I've ever owned by far. I spent thousands of dollars trying to keep that thing on the road. It was worth like 800 bucks. Nothing I did could, could stop it from swallowing more money at the mechanic shop when I bought it. And eventually my brother-in-law got a hold of me, and he sold me this 1991 Honda Accord. And, oh, my gosh, that was a good car. After owning that Beretta, this, this Honda was so great. It would run everywhere it was supposed to. It never left me stranded. And I had that car for several years out of high school. And when I moved to tech school, I had it. Eventually, I, I moved to Las Vegas as a mechanic and got a job there. In my first month in Las Vegas, the, the shop I worked for, CarMax, down there in Henderson in the southern suburb of Las Vegas, they put me up in a hotel for one month. They said, you can stay here for a month while you find a place to live, but we want you to start now. And so I moved down there, enjoyed the hotel, Got my free continental breakfast every morning, but a couple weeks after I got there, my father was kind enough to come down, and he helped me look for apartments, and we canvassed all over, spent three days just driving around looking for the cheap apartments that weren't listed in the big, in the big sales books. And eventually, we found a nice place. Two weeks later, my dad and my mom and a couple of my siblings loaded up in, a, in, in my dad's pickup with a whole load of cheap auction furniture he'd bought for next to nothing so I could furnish my first place. In fact, kind of funny story, my first few nights in my apartment in Las Vegas, I didn't know it took three days for them to turn the power on at that place. Uh, I found out from experience. I showed up, and I'm like, okay, do I just need to get the power transferred to my name? No, you need to call and get it turned on. I lived with an ice box and an oil lantern for my first three days in there uh, as my way of getting by. But they came down, and they brought all this furniture. I'd been a sleeping bag on the floor. Suddenly I had a bed. It was great. And the last day they were there, we went out to this place called Mimi's Cafe. It was this nice little cafe, well-reviewed. It was in the parking lot of the great big Sunset Station Casino. And uh, we went there. And I remember as we pulled up to that casino... I was looking to park my car, and it's a, you know, it's a big parking lot here because it's one of these mega casinos that this is outside of. And so they have these massive light posts. Just the concrete pillar that holds the light post is like three feet across. And, and so I thought, I'll park right here because I always have a hard time finding my car. I forget by the time I come out of Walmart or wherever, where on earth it's at. Now we've got a van so big and ugly you can always find it. But, but, um, but I go and I park the thing there, and we go inside, and all of us go, and we grab a nice breakfast together. And my parents were going to leave that afternoon, so we thought, this is a good plan. And I get out from Mimi's Cafe, and I go walk around to the parking lot, and I walk up to the light post, and you know what's not there? My car. And I think, maybe I didn't remember right. Like, I do get confused about it. Let me go look around and see where else. And we walk all over that parking lot. My whole family's canvassing around here. Pretty soon, you know, we're 100 yards out from where the cafe is, and the parking wasn't that cramped. And so I think, crap. Somebody stole my car. So I call the police. A couple minutes later, they show up. They write a brief report. They say, hey, listen, kid, I know you're new to Las Vegas, but you need to know we don't have the resources to track down every crime that happens here. So there's not going to be anyone investigating this. If we happen to pull over the car, then fine. But you should just expect your cars in Mexico being chopped to pieces by now. Oh, <laughs> how encouraging. Okay. So now I have like six hours before my parents leave to find a new car. Because when they leave, I'm like five miles away from work and I can't walk there every day. And so we go back to the, play, the shop I work at and with some help from some of the senior techs there, we find a, a cheap 1997 Saturn SL on the back lot. I, and I, I think I pay 1800 bucks for that. I think my mom loaned me like $400 and I had a cash to do it otherwise. Buy that car. And I go about my life thinking, that's too bad. My Honda's gone. I love that car. But, you know, this Saturn's okay. And uh, a month later, 11.59 p.m. at night, I remember the time very distinctly because I wondered who on earth is calling me at 11.59 p.m. at night. A police officer calls me. Is this, is this Mr. Pounds? Yeah, yeah, it is. Now I'm worried. Like, what did I do to get in trouble with the law here? I've been in my apartment all night, so I can't have done something too bad, can I? I'm, I'm alone. Um, he says, I wanted you to know we found your car, and it's at the Walmart off Boulder Highway. Now, the irony is the Walmart off Boulder Highway is two blocks from my house. So they stole the car like five miles away, and they dumped it two blocks from my house. But that would be fine. I could walk there. But he says, oh, but a tow truck came and got it. They drug it off. And so now it's at this impound yard another five miles away. Oh. And so the next morning, I, I get my friend, Sean, who was my mentor there at the shop, and he drives out there with me so we can go try to get this car. And the, the tow place says, we're not sure it's even going to start. And I go into my car, and I mean, I'm not the tidiest person ever, but I try to keep my car reasonably clean. 
There are disgusting fast food wrappers everywhere. There's like rotting food on the floor. There's stuff in the car that's broken that wasn't broken before. You know, I get in there, just piles of garbage everywhere. And so I, I go and I, and I climb into the car and I slide, I'm praying about it. I slide my old key into the ignition. And incidentally, they'd taken a screwdriver and just hammered it right into the ignition to get it to start. Uh, somehow it started though. By God's grace, the stupid car started. And I got in it. And, you know, before when I got in that car, I was like, man, I love this car. I'm so grateful for this car. But you know how I felt when I got into the car that time? I felt dirty. I felt like, ugh, this thing's been desecrated, you know? There's filth stuff. There's food rotting around here. I don't know who is in it, but it's gross now. And I drove that car home, and I just parked it. And for a month, I went out there and worked on it. I went, and I got, you know, a couple trash bags filled with garbage. And there was some of my own stuff mixed in with it. So it was like a weird scavenger hunt. Like, is this mine or, or you know, whatever addict stole this or whatever. And I get it. I pile it in there. We throw that in the garbage. I go through and I, I even vacuum the whole thing. I shampoo the car, but I wipe down the dash. I fix a couple of things that are broken in it. And a month or so later, the car looked a lot different. And I could get into it then. And I felt like, okay, it feels a little more like my old car. And the interesting thing is, we kept that car for over a decade. I had it for another year or two. Then my younger brother, he needed a car, and I sold it to him for a 1000 bucks, and he took it over. He drove it for another decade, and then eventually we sold it to a, a young kid who was looking for a starter car at the shop I worked at in Boise. So it, and it was at like 350,000 miles at that point. So we got a lot of life out of that cool little Honda, uh, and it was a good car. But I'll tell you what, I love that thing, and I took such pride in it. And then we transitioned to I just felt dirty sitting in it. And by God's grace, it transformed into something else before we were done. I point that out to say to you, in our lives, it's the same way. You might have started in good standing in your relationship with God. You might have been right on the right track. And maybe right now, as you're sitting here, you're saying, Pastor, I don't like you talking about all this sin stuff because some of it is landing right here. And I'm not a fan of that. What I want to tell you is the good news is Jesus wants to transform that today. He will take all the garbage out. He'll clean it up. He'll shampoo the carpets. He'll fix the broken ignition. He'll do those things. As long as you unlock the door and let him in. As long as you're actually willing to take the steps to be there with him and help him in that process. You're, the, the ways that, that your life has been fouled up or broken, they don't have to be the way you are tomorrow. God actually wants you to be transformed. And that's really what Paul's getting at in this passage. We can live lives committed to our sin, or we can live lives that are committed to our Savior. But we can't be defined by both at once. Can't be there. So at some point, we got to choose. And let me say, I know firsthand, sometimes that choice is one where it takes more than a month to make it clean again. It takes some time to get things fixed. But if you'll commit to it and say to Jesus, whatever you want, I'll burn that bridge, I'll move that way, I'll do that, you'll start to see things look different in your life. You'll start to see them transform. That's what Paul is telling the people of Corinth, and it's the truth for us today. If we're owned by our sins, it will tear us apart. We'll eat each other alive. But if we're not, we could be renewed, and we can be a testimony to how great God is and what he can accomplish. At this point, I'm going to call Kent forward, and he's going to uh, lead us in our meditation here. While he's coming up, Amy, I'll, I'll invite Amy up too to lead us in a closing song. I'll ask you to join me in prayer. Lord, I don't know what everybody ate this morning, but I know it couldn't have been as bad as what Petra did. Um, and yet our sin, our decisions to hold to our sin to justify them, to excuse them. They don't make us a whole lot different than her. Father, I pray you'd help us to sense that foul taste in our mouth and to spit it out, to take in good things, to be focused on you and to be transformed by you. Lord, lead us to make that commitment today and to be different because of it. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.